So let us today talk about post-exposure management of rabies. It consists of wound treatment and risk assessment and treatment and immunization after a possible rabies exposure will depend on circumstances of exposure, nature of exposure, species of animal involved, country area, the immune status of the exposed person. So let us jump start and uh, look at each step one by one. So first and foremost is wound treatment. As soon as possible after the incident, the wound should be cleaned thoroughly by flushing under a running tap water for several minutes. And preferably we should use uh, soap and detergent along with the water. Uh, suitable disinfectant should be applied and wound should be covered with uh, simple dressing. This disinfectant could be 40 to 70 percent alcohol. You can even use tincture or aqueous solution of iodine. Salivary exposure to mucous membrane such as eye, nose or mouth uh, should be washed thoroughly with clean water as soon as possible. So the main thing is uh, the washing of the wound and apply disinfectant and dressing in case of skin wounds. But if it is mucous membrane exposure like eyes, nose and mouth, then just washing with clean water, that is what is required. Now, some people ask that uh, what should be done, whether to suture the wound or not. Now, the primary suture um, could have caused uh, further damage to the wound and it may increase the risk of introduction of rabies virus to the now. That means it may propagate the infection. So ideally it should be avoided uh, if it is possible. Uh, but if it is not possible to avoid it, then at least postpone it until the post-exposure treatment has come out. In patient requiring uh, HRIG or sutures uh, should be delayed and until the immunoglobulin has been infiltrated into the wound. That means wait uh, at least before immunoglobulin, if it is to be given, uh, uh, before suturing, right. So this is an important uh, aspect of wound care, that is suturing and we should be very cautious about it. Now coming to uh, the next step that is risk assessment. Each case requires a full risk assessment based on the detail information about the circumstances of potential exposure. Uh, the healthcare profession would try to collect as much as information as possible to inform the risk assessment. The risk assessment should be carried out rapidly so that post exposure treatment if needed can be started promptly. But uh, treatment may need to start before the full information is available on ownership or condition of the biting animal. So minimum information which is required to complete the risk assessment and initiate the post-exposure treatment uh, that is uh, uh, important and that we need to know. So the first is uh, patient's and demographic details, name, age, day, uh, birth date, address, NHS number if possible, date of exposure, species and current health status of animal, country of exposure, category of exposure, site on the body of exposure, whether the patient is immunosuppressed or has any allergies that we need to know, any previous rabies vaccination or immunoglobulin treatment uh, if patient has taken, uh, weight of the patient uh, if HRIG is uh, being considered. So this is the minimum information which is uh, needed uh, uh, to uh, know for starting treatment. So there are eight or nine points that we should remember. Now, uh, we know that incubation period of rabies uh, can be very long and treatment should still be considered even if uh, interval from exposure is very long. And risk assessment should always be done, even if uh, exposure 
has occurred months or years previously and this is a very common case in travelers where they have been bitten a month or years ago or sometimes elderly or children and uh, they present later on so uh, this is important So let's uh, move forward. So following features are uh, important to consider. Uh, first is the country of exposure. Then uh, animal source exposure. And uh, category and site of exposure. Finally, the immune status of the individual. So let us see one by one. Now countries um, are classified as high, low or no risk for rabies uh, as per different animal species. The animal source, um, the rabies can be transmitted by saliva of any warm blooded animals like bats, monkeys, rodents, cats, dogs, foxes. Um, animals behaving abnormally represent a higher risk of infection. But uh, that does not mean that normal appearing behavior of animal can exclude rabies. So yes, if they are behaving abnormally, obviously there is a high chance of rabies. But normal appearance does not exclude uh, rabies. Unprovoked bites. Animals usually don't uh, bite you without provocation. But if they do, obviously there is more chance or more risk of rabies. A regularly vaccinated animal is unlikely to be rabid. Sometimes you have seen very rarely uh, vaccinated dogs have transmitted rabies. Uh, domestic dogs and cats, if they are behaving normally 15 days after exposure, uh, they would not have been infectious at the time of exposure. That's why wherever possible try to observe them for at least 15 days uh, if they begin to behave uh, abnormally. Uh, so 15 days is the observation period that we should remember. So normal looking animal, that doesn't mean that we can exclude rabies and 15 days observation period. Now coming to uh, category and uh, site of exposure, high risk of exposure are those with broken skin, having single or multiple transdermal bites, severe lacerations, mucous membranes or existing skin lesions, having contaminated by animal saliva or other body fluid. And as we know, intact skin is a barrier against the infection. That is the first thing that we have talked in uh, the introduction session. Now, bites and severe laceration, they are uh, high risk than the scratches. Bad bites, uh, now this is very important, especially in UK, that bad bites are usually felt than uh, seen. So, they may not be visible, but if person is saying that I have felt the bad bite, then you believe that, okay, bad biting has happened. So that is an important point to consider. Proximal bites towards head and neck carry obviously higher risk compared to the distal wounds because the uh, traveling distance is uh, shorter for the virus to reach the brain. Immune status of individual. Now people who are already um, primed by pre-exposure rabies immunization, obviously they will respond better on post-exposure treatment and they will not require uh, immunoglobulin, HRIG. Now, post-exposure treatment uh, may have been started elsewhere and further treatment will depend on date and type of vaccine already received. Even suppressed uh, individuals uh, should have been managed with a greater degree of caution and care and they will uh, uh, mount uh, poor response to immunization that is possible. So that is to be taken into consideration. Now, post-exposure treatment, uh, now it will depend on which country it has happened, type or terrestrial animal which is involved and category of exposure. And based on these three criteria, we calculate a composite rabies uh, risk and uh, along with patients immunization status and immune competency uh, we will decide whether post-exposure treatment is actually required 
or not and if it is required then what it is that is need to be done. So let us understand the categories of exposure which is this table is adapted from World Health Organization. So there are as you can see three categories one, two and uh, three and uh, we have divided animal types into two terrestrial mammals and bats. So let us first see terrestrial mammals and how this category work with them. So category one is no physical contact with saliva that means the animal is just uh, touched you, stroke you, or f you have tried to fight the animals. So touching, stroking, feeding, uh, well, no physical contact with saliva is there, that is category one. If minimal contact with saliva or you are unable to infiltrate wound with uh, human rabies immunoglobulin if needed, then you have to consider it uh, category two. So bruising, abrasions, leaks to broken skin, minor scratches uh, not down to muscle minor bites uh, they are included in uh, category two uh, direct contact with saliva that is uh, in case of severe or deep laceration down to the muscle uh, then uh, major scratches or major bites involving muscle uh, they are obviously at the risk. Now bats, so in case of bats category 1 is no physical contact just uh, touching of bat is there and person has uh, worn all the protective clothing or barriers to prevent the saliva contact like boot, shoe, but uh, if uh, uncertain physical contact is there where person is not sure. Uh, for example, handling of bat without appropriate protective clothing or gloves or persons uh, yeah, in persons hair a bat has become tangled uh, accidentally then we are not sure that whether saliva contact has happened or not. So that is category 2. When you are sure that direct physical contact with bat saliva has happened that is category 3 all bites and scratches, contamination of mucous membrane. So that is um, in category 3. A person um, uh, has seen that uh, in, in the same room uh, the bat has been found where a person was sleeping or intoxicated or it is a young child uh, and from there bat has been recovered or seen or found that is category uh, 3. So let us now see the composite uh, risk uh, rabies table. So as you can see, uh, we have country risk, no, low and high. Then we have category of exposure 1, 2 and 3. Now if uh, it is a no risk country, then any category is green exposure. You don't need to worry. Or if it is category 1, then regardless of country, uh, risk you are safe. So green uh, is basically no risk country or category 1 exposure right. Uh, amber is when well low risk category 2, 3 is there or high risk category 2 is there and uh, red category that is basically uh, category 3 high risk. So that is the only thing that we should remember. That means uh, country risk is uh, no low and high 1 2 3 exposure and that's how we remember this uh, table so i think it is very simple enough now uh, based on this categorization we will ascertain whether uh, uh, we need post exposure profile access uh, or not and whether it is needed then what should be done the vaccination should be taken intramuscularly uh, that we know and bleeding disorder it has to be given deep subcutaneously. Now this is important table. Now we know that uh, we have CRR that is composite rabies risk into green, amber and red. If it is green nothing is required regardless of patient's immune status. But if it is uh, amber then 
a patient could be immunosuppressed, fully immunized and non-immunized. Then uh, in case of non-immunized or fully immunized, uh, non-immunized you give four, five, five day, four doses of vaccine, 0, 3, 7, 21 days. In case of fully immunized, you give at 0 and 3, uh, two doses. And immunosuppressed, you give immunoglobulin plus uh, you give five doses. In red, in case of non-immunized and immunosuppressed, you give immunoglobulin plus five doses. So, for amber, four doses of vaccine in non-immunized and two doses of vaccine in fully immunized. And immunosuppressed, you give five doses plus immunoglobulin. And in case of red, uh, only fully immunized people will not receive the immunoglobulin. Otherwise, immunoglobulin needs to be given. Right? And immunoglobulin. Uh, is not required if more than seven days after the first dose of vaccine uh, has already been given or uh, one day after the second dose of vaccine because then it, it is of no use. So this is the final table explaining the post-exposure treatment. So green uh, you require nothing, amber and red will require. Uh, the post exposure treatment. So, yes, this is uh, we have already talked. And, uh, so, suppose an individual arrives in the UK um, and he has started post exposure treatment via intradermal route, then obviously, remaining doses to be given by intramuscular route. regime which has started which is different that is uh, from UK then obviously you should uh, seek a specialist uh, advice. So that's it uh, for post exposure treatment the further details we will discuss in uh, next sessions. Thank you.